here we go. It is Friday, April the 3rd, and we are on our last point on this journey through the Bible. Let's review where we've been so far. 1. Creation. 2. Human beings. 3. The fall. 4. Redemption promised. 5. Abraham. 6. Judah the king. 7. The Passover Lamb, 8, King David, 9, The Suffering Servant, 10, Resurrection Promised, remember what's next, 11, New Creation, 12, Fulfillment, 13, The Cross, 14, Resurrection, 15, Justification, and finally, our last point today is 16, glory. Okay, so um, as we have been going through these points, it could have seemed a little bit like sin um, has sent us on a little bit of a detour. That all oh, because of sin, we had to go this way instead of that way. But all of everything that we have talked about has been in God's perfect will for us and for his glory. Um, his son coming and dying in our place it is his will. God does not have a plan B or a plan C or a plan D. He, I want that to be clear even now. He's not running around trying to figure out what to do about this virus. This has not somehow upset his his plan, or his purpose. He's still on the throne. He is still very much in control. Remember how we saw him in Exodus? And Moses goes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says no. We saw God so in charge. Not like, oh no, Pharaoh said no. What are we going to do now? Well, I think I have another plague I can give. No. God even said, Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is going to say, no, right? We see God all, if we look clearly all the way through the Bible, we see someone who is absolutely in charge. We can't argue with that at all. And so we see that here. And we have seen as we've gone through all of these different points that God is in charge and revealing his will. Will and making it happen as time goes on. But now here's the important part that we want to make sure we understand today is that this story, okay, so we've gone through the Bible and let's say we get all the way to the end. This story is not over. It didn't end 2,000 years ago and now we are just kind of catching up on a historical event. We are a part of it. It's real just as much today as it was 2,000 years ago. And now we're called to play our part in it. Okay? Um, and what um, this says, while Isaiah 65 gave us a glimpse at the new days that were coming, we find the culmination. And the culmination means everything building to one point. Okay? The culmination of the vision is in Revelation. And Revelation is the last book of the Bible that tells us about how God will reign over everything in the end. And we see God's purposes coming to, the word is fruition, meaning coming to be, be made, to be true, to finally be revealed to everyone. God's people will finally live with God, uncorrupted by sin and death, unharried by worry and pain, unconcerned about whether and how we can earn God's favor. It'll be done. Remember how I've talked to you about how I long for the day when I can live with God and not sin, that I don't know what that's like. I don't know what it's like to love God with all my heart, and I won't know until I go to heaven, and I will be able to worship him without sin. Oh, I long for that. I long for that day. And that is that is God doing that in my heart, giving me that desire, giving me that want to see that. 
Um, John is the one that wrote Revelation. He was exiled to an island, and while he was on that island, God gave him this vision of what was to come. And, you know, Christians believe different things about what the end times will look like, and that is okay. Um, Revelation can often be kind of confusing as we read through it. And the images John saw, he probably didn't, couldn't make sense of. Can you imagine God giving him a vision that had airplanes and cars in it? John wouldn't have known anything about that. So how would he describe that? So it's really hard for us to figure out what exactly it's going to look like. But we do know that it will come. We do know that at the end, Jesus will reign and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And this tells us a little bit about it. I'm going to read this to you from Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of the heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. The tabernacle. Remember when we talked about the tabernacle? The tabernacle was what? What was the purpose of it? It was where God was meeting with the people, right? He said, You will put my Ark of the Covenant here, and this is where I will meet with you. Now it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now God is dwelling with us finally. What was supposed to happen in, in the Garden of Eden is now finally coming true. And he will dwell with them, live with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. Done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all these things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Isn't that a wonderful promise? That's the promise that we have. We have he that overcomes. Jesus has overcome for us. And I'm going to get all the way to the end. And when I get all the way to the end, I will be able to worship God with no sin, with my full heart in his presence. And God will one day take all of this suffering, take all of this trouble, take all of these problems away and make it the way that it was intended to be in Eden. It says the curse will be irreversibly crushed and we will experience what Adam and Eve were only beginning to taste in the garden. That dwelling place of God will permanently be with man. And that's a thread that we can see all the way through, right? The d God dwelling with man. He wanted to dwell with Adam and Eve, but he couldn't because of the sin. Then he says, I'm going to dwell with you in the tabernacle. And then Jesus comes and it says that he made his tent there and dwelled with men through Jesus. So this dwelling place of God is not anything new. It's not anything different. It's the same concept from the very beginning that God had in mind. Because of the work of Jesus, our Messiah and King, we finally will live as God intended under his perfect rule in the place he prepared for us, living with him forever. As it was at the very beginning, God's people will always be dependent on him for life. But we have seen that we can always, that he can always be trusted to give what we need. And for all eternity, we will have the joy of trusting him and receiving from him. 
And we can have that joy now as I lean on him, as I trust him to provide my needs, to take care of me, even in craziness, even in weird situations where I'm teaching you from my own and you're sitting at home watching me. Even in these crazy times, we can lean on God and trust him that he is giving us what we need. This is what we were made for to live in and enjoy the life-giving presence of God. To love Him and to enjoy Him. That's why I was made. God wants me to enjoy Him. He wants me to go outside and enjoy the sunset and the sunrise if you're up that early. To enjoy the the green as it's coming onto the trees. To listen to the birds. to, To enjoy Him. Never feel guilty when you're joying in pleasures that He gives you. That's what he created you to do. He creates us to see beauty and to create beauty and to love it. And it says, right now, he is making new creatures as more and more people around the world put their hope in him as their only savior. And he calls us, this is your job now, okay? He calls you to proclaim the good news to this world that is still suffering in sin and death. We have the joy of seeing God at work to reverse the curse and defeat the serpent. We get to announce this good news of Jesus' victory and invite our neighbors and friends to turn from their sin and trust in Him alone as their substitute and Savior. So the very last part of this book says, So put down this book and get to work. He has called you to join this mission. And that's yours too. You don't have to wait till you're grown. You don't have to wait till you're older and you can go do this or that. As we have joy in our hearts, we just simply talk about it. And we share with other people. Now, if if you're struggling feeling that joy and dependence on Jesus, that's where I want you to start though. You start there and you pray and you ask God to give you an understanding of who he is and what he has done so that he can give you joy and then give you a desire to share others. It doesn't come the other way around. Don't don't be guilty about not sharing if you don't have the joy yourself. I want you to have joy first. Then, just like a cup, if I'm filling a cup up, when it's full, it just overflows. That's how we're supposed to share. As the joy is bubbling up in our hearts, it bubbles over, and then we can't help but share it to those around us. It just spills over. Okay, but if my cup is low, it it's just me kind of dipping my fingers in and spraying it out when I'm telling people, and that it doesn't communicate as well. Okay? All right, let's put the whole story together. Here we go. Are you ready? God created a kingdom, and he is the king, but he made human beings to represent him in that kingdom. Adam and Eve rejected this call, which led to sin and death, but God promised to defeat the serpent through the seed of the woman who is also the seed of Abraham. Through Abraham's family, and specifically Judah's royal seed, David, the covenant blessings would come to the world. Because all people were guilty and deserved death, the sacrifices of the Mosaic law revealed more clearly their need for a substitute, the suffering servant. Through the servant and the work of the Spirit, God would establish a new covenant and give lasting life to his people in the new heavens and the new earth. Last paragraph. Jesus is the one through whom all of these promises find fulfillment. First, in his sacrificial death for sin as a necessary and just payment for sin, and then in his victorious resurrection and reign as king. This great story 
will find its culmination ending when the redeemed from every tribe, tongue, and nation gather in the new creation to live with God forever. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your plan. We thank you that you have worked it all out before um, we were born, before time began. And we thank you that you have made us a part of it. I pray that you would give us uh, that joy in you and dependence on you as we uh, seek to live our lives to honor you. That you would give us a joy in what you have done for us and continuing to do that we would want to share with other people. I pray for each of my students today. I pray that you would give them a good Friday, that you would um, help them as they are um, with their families, that you would help them to get along, that you would give them good fun days. I pray that you would help us to trust you in the middle of, of weird, unusual, and sometimes a little scary times that we would trust you um, to continue to work out your plan in our lives and in the world around us. We do pray for our leaders and those in charge that you would give them wisdom and help them during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love each one of you and I hope you have a great day and a wonderful weekend.